1989. Christopher Ochoa is sitting in a police interrogation room in Austin, Texas. He's 22 years old. He's being questioned about a brutal murder and rape at a pizza hut. He didn't do it. He was working at another pizza hut across town when it happened. He has an alibi. But the detectives don't care about his alibi. They have a different strategy. They tell him they have witnesses who saw him. They have physical evidence. They have his friend ready to testify against him. The case is airtight. You're going to death row, they tell him, unless you confess. If you confess, tell us it wasn't premeditated. We can get you a deal. Life in prison instead of execution. You're young. You might get parole someday. Christopher is terrified. He's been in this room for hours. He's exhausted. And he starts doing math in his head. If he keeps denying it and they have all this evidence, he's going to be convicted. Death penalty. He'll be executed. If he confesses, he gets life in prison. Maybe parole in 20 years. He'll be 42. He could still have a life. Death versus potential freedom. Which would you choose? Christopher Ochoa confessed. He gave detailed information about the crime. He pleaded guilty to murder and rape. He spent 12 years in prison before DNA evidence proved he didn't do it. The actual killer confessed. Christopher was completely innocent. So why did he confess? Because detectives presented him with a probability calculation that made confessing seem like the rational choice. Except every number in that calculation was a lie. This isn't rare. About 25% of DNA exonerations involve false confessions. Hundreds of innocent people are in prison right now because they confessed to crimes they didn't commit. Not because they were tortured. Not because they're stupid. But because interrogators exploit a mathematical formula. A formula that weaponizes how humans misunderstand probability under pressure to make innocent people believe that confessing is their best chance of survival. This is the false confession formula. Let me show you the math that interrogators use. You're in an interrogation room. You're innocent. But the detective presents you with two choices. Choice one, deny the crime. Go to trial. The detective tells you, we have overwhelming evidence. DNA, witnesses, video footage. The conviction rate in cases like this is 95%. And if you're convicted at trial, the judge will throw the book at you. First degree murder. That's life without parole. Maybe death penalty if the DA wants it. Choice two, confess. But if you confess right now, admit what you did, show remorse, we can work with the DA, get you a plea deal, maybe second degree murder, 15 years. You'll be out in 10 with good behavior. You'll still have a life. Now let's do the math. This is called expected value, calculating the average outcome of a decision. If you deny, go to trial. 95% chance of conviction, life sentence, let's say 50 years, 5% chance of acquittal, zero years. Expected value, 0 0.95 times 50 plus 0 0.05 times 0 equals 47.5 years in prison. If you confess, 100% chance of conviction, you're pleading guilty. Plea deal, 15 years, out in 10. Expected value, 10 years in prison. The math is clear. 10 years is better than 47.5 years. Confessing is the rational choice. This is exactly how interrogators frame it. They don't say, we want you to confess to something you didn't do. They say, let's be smart about this. Let's look at your options. Let's minimize your risk. And when you're exhausted, terrified, and isolated in that room, the math seems airtight. So you confess. You sign the paper. You plead guilty. But here's what they didn't tell you. Every single number in that calculation was a lie. Let's start with the biggest lie. We have a 95% chance of convicting you at trial. If you're actually innocent, if there's no real evidence connecting you to the crime, the probability of conviction at trial is nowhere near 95%. But interrogators make you believe it's 95% through a technique called false evidence ploy. In the United States, police are legally allowed to lie to you during interrogations. They can claim they have evidence they don't have. They can claim witnesses exist who don't exist. They can fabricate entire scenarios. We have your DNA at the scene. They don't. We have three witnesses who saw you. They don't. We have you on video. They don't. Your accomplice already confessed and said you were the shooter. There's no accomplice. These lies serve one purpose, to inflate your perceived probability of conviction. If you believe they have DNA evidence, witnesses, and video, then yeah, 95% conviction rate seems reasonable. You'd lose at trial. But if they don't have that evidence, if they're bluffing, then your actual probability of conviction might be 20% or 10% or 5%. Let's redo the math with accurate probabilities. If you deny, go to trial. Accurate version. 10% chance of conviction equals 50 years. 
90% chance of acquittal equals zero years. Expected value, 0, 0.10 times 50 plus 0 0.90 times zero equals five years. If you confess, expected value, 10 years. Suddenly the math flips. Denying is the better option. Going to trial gives you an expected value of five years versus 10 years for confessing. But you don't know the evidence is fake. You don't know they're lying. You're making a decision based on false probabilities. This is the trap. Interrogators don't just ask you to confess. They manipulate your probability estimates to make confessing seem mathematically optimal. The false evidence ploy is just one technique. Let me show you the full arsenal interrogators use to corrupt your probability calculations. Technique 1. Minimization. The detective acts sympathetic. Look, I get it. Things got out of hand. You didn't mean for this to happen. It was an accident, right? Heat of the moment? That's not murder. That's manslaughter. That's a huge difference. What they're doing? Reframing the crime as less serious to make confessing feel safer. If you believe it's manslaughter, eight years, instead of murder, life, the expected value of confessing drops dramatically. Technique two, maximization. The other detective, they often work in pairs, takes the opposite approach. You know what? I think you planned this. I think you're a cold-blooded killer. The DA is going to push for death penalty, and they're going to get it. What they're doing? Inflating the worst-case scenario to make the plea deal seem attractive by comparison. Death penalty versus 15 years? The 15 years sounds merciful. Technique 3. The ticking clock. This offer expires in 10 minutes. After that, the DA gets involved, and all deals are off the table. This is your one chance. What they're doing? Creating time pressure that prevents you from thinking clearly or consulting a lawyer. Under time pressure, humans make worse probability estimates and take safe options even when they're not optimal. Technique 4. Social proof. Your friend already confessed. He said you were the one who pulled the trigger. He's cooperating, getting a great deal. You're going to take the fall alone unless you tell your side of the story. What they're doing. Making you think the game has already changed. If your accomplice confessed, your probability of conviction just skyrocketed. Better confess too. Often, there is no accomplice or the accomplice didn't confess. Technique five, contamination. During hours of interrogation, detectives accidentally reveal details about the crime, where it happened, what weapon was used, what the victim was wearing. Then later, when you're exhausted and confused, they ask you to describe what happened, what they're doing, feeding you information that you then repeat back, which makes your confession seem detailed and credible. Only the real killer would know these details, but you only know them because they told you. All of these techniques have one goal. Corrupt your probability estimates so that confessing seems like the mathematically optimal decision. Let me tell you about the Central Park Five. This case shows how the false confession formula destroys lives. 1989. A woman is brutally attacked in Central Park. Five teenagers, black and Latino, ages 14 to 16, are arrested. They're interrogated for hours, some for over 24 hours, without parents present, without lawyers. The detectives use every technique I just described. They claim they have evidence. They claim the other teens are blaming each other. They promise leniency for cooperation. All five teenagers confess, on video, with details. They're convicted. They serve between six and 13 years in prison. In 2002, the actual attacker confesses. DNA proves he did it alone. The five teenagers were completely innocent. Why did they confess? Because they were kids doing probability calculations with false information. The detective says, we have witnesses, we have evidence, you're going to be convicted as an adult, that's 20 years. Or you can tell us you were just there, you didn't do the actual attack, and we'll go easy on you. Juvenile detention, out when you're 18. If you're 14 years old, terrified, exhausted, and a man in authority is telling you the math says you should confess, you confess. Teenagers are especially vulnerable because they trust authority figures, have less developed risk assessment. Think the truth will come out eventually. Don't understand the legal system. Are more susceptible to pressure and exhaustion. The false confession. Formula works best on people who are bad at probability calculations, which, under stress and exhaustion, is everyone. Here's what interrogators understand that you don't. You're not calculating probabilities correctly because you don't have accurate information. Let's talk about Bayesian reasoning. The right way to update probabilities based on evidence. Bayes' theorem says, the probability of guilt given the evidence depends on 1. The prior probability How likely were you to commit this crime before any evidence? 2. The strength of the evidence How much does this evidence actually point to you? 
If you're innocent, your prior probability of guilt is essentially zero. You didn't do it. For that prior to change significantly, you need strong evidence, real evidence, DNA that actually matches, video that actually shows you, witnesses who actually saw you. But in that interrogation room, you don't know what evidence they actually have. They say they have DNA. But do they? They say witnesses saw you. But did they? You're updating your probability estimate based on claims, not evidence. And claims are cheap. Here's the math you should be doing. If they really had strong evidence, they wouldn't need your confession. They'd charge you immediately. They wouldn't be offering deals. If they're offering you deals and pressing for confession, they probably don't have strong evidence. They need your confession to make the case. Your probability of conviction at trial is much lower than they claim, but you can't think this clearly when you're in that room. You're exhausted. You're scared. They've been telling you for eight hours that conviction is certain. So how do you protect yourself? How do you avoid falling into this mathematical trap? First, never talk to police without a lawyer. Ever. I don't care if you're innocent. I don't care if you have nothing to hide. I don't care if they say only guilty people ask for lawyers. The moment you're being questioned about a crime, say, I want a lawyer. Then shut up. Second, never accept the probabilities the interrogator presents. Third, understand that they're legally allowed to lie to you. In the U.S., police can lie about evidence during interrogations. They can lie about witnesses. They can lie about what other suspects said. They can lie about deals and offers. Fourth, the confess now for a better deal is almost always a trap. If you're innocent, confessing is almost never the mathematically optimal decision. No matter how they frame the probabilities, yes, trials are risky. Yes, juries make mistakes. But if you're actually innocent and there's no real evidence, your probability of conviction is much lower than they claim. Fifth, time pressure is a manipulation tactic. This deal expires in 10 minutes, is designed to prevent you from thinking clearly or consulting a lawyer. Let me bring this back to Christopher Ochoa. He confessed because detectives made him believe the math said he should. He spent 12 years in prison, 12 years he can never get back, because he tried to make a rational decision with false information. Christopher Ochoa was eventually exonerated. The state of Texas paid him $5 million in compensation. But no amount of money gives back 12 years of your life. The false confession formula is elegant. It's effective. And it ruins lives. Because it doesn't just get confessions. It gets confessions that seem voluntary, rational, and credible. Confessions that convince juries. Confessions that hold up in court. If this could prevent a false confession, share it. If you've ever wondered how innocent people end up in prison, hit that like button. Subscribe. Because now that you know about the false confession formula, you'll understand why the first thing you should say is, I want a lawyer. And you'll never trust a confession the same way again.